Welcome back to the realm of unpopular opinions and this video, hopefully not four hours long, is going to be Ruin and Rising and the short story The Demon in the Wood. I'm taking a deep breath because this will likely be the most detailed one because this is my favorite part of the trilogy and I will have the most emotions. I, for perspective i cried at the ending of ruin and rising both times that i read it so i have no idea what's gonna happen this time and we're starting off with demon in the wood this time unlike with the tailor because i am not in the mood to get emotionally wrecked after the ending we're gonna get emotionally wrecked in the beginning so i pulled it up on my um uh, tablet i have it at the end of a paperback just like the tailor but I thought it'd be better like this so I can not annotate, but like mark some passages and then later find them so I can comment. It seems a little bit easier because, yeah, <laughs> I prefer doing it that way. I bought that ebook back when I found out it existed. I was like, there's a Darkling prequel. Excellent. Yes, let's buy it, even though I'd never in my life actually bought an ebook at that time. So I will not ramble more in the beginning because I will already ramble enough. I realize this is a funny angle, but because I'm actually rarely here, the <laughs> I am one page in and I already feel like crying. I won't hog the clip, but his throat was raw because I was screaming when they pushed me under. Enough, his mother's voice, cool and hard as diamond. Madraya, he was embarrassed by the relief that rushed through him. You're not a child, he told himself, but he felt like one lying there in his wet clothes, cold and helpless. His mother's face was creased with concern, but he recognized the watchful look in her eyes, too. They were the newcomers. They were always the newcomers. And when things went bad, they were the easiest people to blame. I won't even comment. I just, I think that speaks for itself. This book, even though it shows you how actually powerful and badass Bagra was, it also shows you exactly what she says in Ruin and Rising, how they were hunted and how she actually built his ego because it's like he'd asked his mother if that was the truth once if his father was really dead he will be she'd said before you can blink your eye you'll outlive him by a hundred years maybe a thousand maybe more he's only dust to you like you're raising your son and yeah she wanted a child so she found him find found a man for the job but i'm just imagining a childhood where I'm imagining a childhood like that, and Bagra loved him, and she helped him a lot, but she really took the wrong approach with raising him because, I mean, they were in a terrible situation, I understand that, but I think she should have maybe, I don't know, helped him a bit differently, not foster the fact that he is actually superior because that singles him out even more. I understand it helped because he was already so hated for just existing, even among the Grisha, but I don't know, it just breaks my heart literally every single time I read this. This is also kind of a funny line, but the fact that he says he hadn't the courage to ask her to leave the lamp with him, he was too old to be afraid of the dark. Like, your power is literal darkness, but he was still afraid of the dark. I am weak. I am so not gonna make it through this video. Uh, excuse me. He's 13 here. I was just waiting for when she'd say how old he is. 13. He was 13, but he'd had 100 names, a new one for every town. The world wasn't safe for Grisha, but it was particularly dangerous for the two of them. Like, why did you need to write this short story? Because without it, I would not have been emotionally wrecked. I would have loved him probably a lot less. Because this adds so much to his motivation and who he is as a character. I hate it and love it at the same time. Welcome, Lena, boomed the Ula as he strode toward them. Eric bar barely registered the name his mother had taken to him. She was always Mama Madraya. Mm. He's a 13-year-old boy here. 13. Another interesting detail, in relation to Bagra at least. He still hadn't mastered the cut. His mother had managed it when she was half his age. So Bagra was a boss ass bitch at the age of six and a half? I mean, 
she was the daughter of Ilya Morozova, so it kind of makes sense, but god damn. This, is, this short little book is the perfect example of how different they actually are, because here the Grisha are hunted and really not a good position for them, but imagine being hunted even among them like <laughs> hunted among the hunted that just freaking sucks you just said like everyone either hated their power or wanted it for themselves <laughs> like it it sucks it sucks so hard even their own people don't accept them alexander is literally sherlock holmesing right now because she trained him like that and she's impressed <laughs> She's like, she rose and brushed the hair back from his face. You read the flow of power the way others chart tides. She marveled. It will make you a great leader. He rolled his eyes at that. Again, exhibit A. She wanted him to be a leader. He never wanted that. He was just wrecked. Wrecked from the beginning. As if we needed more proof about him actually... Him, him and his affinity to Alina. Your true name is written here, she said, tapping his chest. Tattooed on your heart. You don't let just anyone read it. He shifted uncomfortably. I know. You don't let just anyone read it. But he literally came to Alina and was like, I want you to have my name. I want you to have that part of me. Oh, it hurts me. It physically hurts me in my chest to read this. And the fact that she tells him, like, this, the cut wasn't the only secret they kept. Just until you're strong enough, she cautioned. Until you learn to defend yourself. Because he can't defend himself yet, so... I'm just gonna cut it off. I literally, literally inhaled sharply when I got to that point. Because the girls thanked him for rescuing them from the bullies. And then one of them, oh no, and he offered his hand. It was only in the second that her fingers closed over his that he realized his mistake. As soon as his hand touched hers, her eyes widened. She drew in a sharp breath. They gazed at each other a long moment. He pulled her to her feet and dropped her hand. But the damage was done. You're an amplifier, she said. Yeah, this is where the problem is created, because even though he rescued them from bullies, even though he did them nothing wrong, this is where he becomes valuable. <laughs> I literally inhaled sharply because I was so... No, I thought it was a little bit longer until this started. I, I am barely handling this. Here we are again. His favorite food is anything sweet. Puddings? He nodded. Pies? He nodded again. I like everything, he said. What's your favorite color? I don't have one. How can you not have one? Deep blue, like the true sea. Red, like the roofs of the shoe temples. The pure buttery color of sunlight. Not really yellow or gold. What would you call it? All the colors you couldn't see in the dark. Okay, A... It's beautiful that he likes the color of Alina's light. It's There's a lot of references that he likes sunlight. But the fact that that tells you that he subconsciously hates the fact that he can summon darkness because he loves light and he loves not being unique. He would do anything probably to have a more regular power and... <sighs> I hate this so much. The fact that he's now hanging out with the girls and he likes one of them is just absolutely shredding my heart into pieces. As you can see, I'm already already tearing up, but I'm not reading this book at a good time. I already know I'm going to cry. But when he realizes what she's doing, the little girl invited him to the pond at night and she's freezing him now in the water. She's gonna kill him with a rock. <laughs> Annika, listen to me. My father can't protect us. I can protect you. We're friends. What are you doing, Annika? He pleaded, though he knew well enough. And now the bully came and they're all fighting. 
Do it, Annika, Eric said loudly. If I'm going to die, I don't want Lev using my power. I'm an amplifier, and when, once Annika wears my bones, you won't be able to push her or her sister around anymore. I am, no, absolutely not. He's sprinting across the ice. Like, this guy literally heard that this boy, a third... My voice is cracking up. That a 13-year-old boy is an amplifier. And he sprinted across the ice to kill him. I'm sorry, she moaned. I'm so sorry. She was crying as she brought the rock, rock down hard on his head. Pain exploded over his right temple and his vision blurred. Don't faint. He gave his head a shake despite the tide of pain that came with it. He saw Annika lifting the rock again. A gust of air struck her. No, she cried. He's mine. They're literally fighting over who's going to get to wear his bow. And he has a knife, of course he does. Eric knew his power would belong to whomever made the kill. That was the way amplifiers worked. Never let them touch you, because one touch was enough to reveal it. This gift lurking inside him. It, fit, it was enough to make him less a boy than a prize. Annika was lifting the rock again. This would be the strike that broke his skull open. He knew it. He's trying to break the ice, which he did. But then he went under the water. Under the water, water, he could see nothing but darkness. He kicked hard. This Annika was on top of him, using her weight to hold him down. He screamed, thrashing in her arms. He can't defend himself yet here, and that's so painful to watch. They're literally both fighting over him, she with the rock and him with the knife, like he's a piece. Everyone was shouting, er Eric wasn't sure, <laughs> sure who had hold of him. A knee pressed into his chest, someone shoved his head beneath the surface again. Water flooded up his nose and into his lungs. I'm going to die here. They'll, <laughs> they'll wear my bones. He heard his mother's voice, vicious like a whip crack. She was always asking more of him, demanding him, demanding it, and now she told him to fight. She spoke his true name. The one she only used when they trained, the name tattooed on his heart, a heart that had not stopped beating, a heart that still had life. With the last bit of his strength, he tore his arm free and lashed out blindly, furiously, with all his terror and rage, with all the hope that had been born and died this day. Let me make a mark on this world before I leave it. He did the cut. He did the cut for the first time. I'm just skipping ahead a little so this clip isn't endless, but... He'd finally managed to use the cut. It had torn through them both. Help me, she croaked. Please, Eric. That's not my name. He needs to wound himself so that the others don't suspect the fact that he killed them. He waited until the sky had begun to lighten. Only then did he summon the shadows and from them draw a dark blade. He was forced to grow up way too soon. He's 13 here. No wonder, through a thousand years, no wonder all his hope died. I only have a little bit left and then I will wrap it up. This is the last two pages. I'll read them out to you. He closed his eyes. I'm sorry. She gave him the barest shake, forcing him to look at her. I'm not. Do you understand me? I would burn a thousand villages, sacrifice a thousand lives to keep you safe it would be us on that pirate if you hadn't thought quickly then her shoulders slumped but i cannot hate that boy and girl for what they tried to do the way we live the way we're forced to live it makes us desperate <clears throat> his mother dozed outside he heard sad voices lifted in songs of mourning as the funeral pyre burned and the grisha offered praise for annika for lev for the otkazatia and the smoking ruins of the valley below his mother must have heard them too the ula is right she said there is no safe place there is no haven not for us he understood then. The Grisha lived as shadows did, passing over the surface of the world, touching nothing, forced to change their shapes and hide in corners, driven by fear as shadows were driven by the sun. 
No safe place, no heaven, no haven. There will be, he promised in the darkness, new words written upon his heart. I will make one. That part always kills me because you can see that that's exactly where he was born, the Darkling, where he took one final name that will be the title that everyone will come to know him as, the Darkling, claiming the darkness and forsaking his name and keeping it inside his heart, stealing it, not trusting anyone anymore, and letting go of all hope. <laughs> driven by fear as shadows were driven by the sun. Also another lovely hint, but... Safe to say that this absolutely destroyed me. I did not need this. Absolutely did not need this in my life. It killed me. This is already probably like 10 minutes, maybe even 15, but I hope you enjoyed. And I hope you enjoyed the fact that I already cried this <laughs> short, this soon into the video. I will come back when I start Ruin and Rising. I am currently on the balcony and a little bit cold, but it's time to update you on what I've been reading. I read the first chapter of Ruin and Rising, which was so long for whatever reason, like really long. And I didn't really have anything to comment so far. She's just below ground, suffering, miserable, because she's with the apparat who I cannot stand. But that aside, the one comment that I do have is how cool it actually is that she is able to, like, bend shadows. I mean, that's the one remnant of the Darkling's power that she has. And I think it's kind of stupid, actually, that he didn't have, like, a little bit of her power. I think it would have been so cool if he had, like, a random ability to bend light even a little. That would have been a very cool detail. But I am thriving because there is absolutely no Nikolai. And after Siege and Storm, I am beyond grateful for that. So for now, that's pretty much all I have to say. And I'll keep reading, but I'm supposed to have lunch soon, so... She broke out. She finally broke out. I mean, dare I say it? Iconic? <laughs> I rem This book, from the beginning, is by far my favorite. Like, I feel like it's just every book is a separate world of its own, and this one is my favorite because all the characters, like Harsha and the one with the cat, I think that is Harsha, and how Zoya changed and how great Mal and Alina are. I love them so much. And just how well they all work together. And then we haven't even gotten to the Darkling yet, but... He is amazing in this book. So basically, I am already having the best time and there's a reason why this one is my favorite. The plot is my favorite, the characters are the best, and I absolutely love how it ended, so... And there's a minimal amount of Nikolai. He is turned into the shadow creature and then he, I think, stays as a shadow creature until the end of the book. And maybe they change him back, I don't know. But there isn't that much Nikolai and I am thriving already. This is gonna be the best one. For better or worse, it's been two years. You won't care because it's two clips, but it has been two years since I was preparing to do this like documented reread but then the show happened and the show put me off reading these books for two years <laughs> but season two is out now I've watched the little bit that I managed to handle of it never again <laughs> but now I'm in the mood again because season two had nothing to do with the books luckily so it couldn't like tarnish it for me but I got even more in the mood to actually reread this book. Last time I was too, like, heartbroken isn't the right word, but just sick of it to read this one. Since this was my favorite, I didn't want to read it half-assed. Here we are, two years later, I am finally ready to complete my, what, third, maybe fourth, I want to say third, reread of this series. This was always my favorite book in the series, so... Let's hope I don't ramble, but we also, we also know each other. We know each other. <laughs> so we know how this is going to go. But I'm going to try and read it like in a day or two. It's a very short book. I'm probably not going to ramble too much. I think the longest part of this video will be the bit that I filmed two years ago, which was the Darkling prequel. 
which by the way, two years later, we finally have the graphic novel for the prequel, which I don't think I even knew was going to be coming out when I was reading it two years ago. This is a bit of a time capsule <laughs> for me and for everyone else. Like I was on break from uni then um, and I'm finishing year two now. <laughs> I think because I've been so fouled by the show, I genuinely forgot how good the book is in comparison. Like, if you if, if there was ever a time to read the Grisha trilogy, it was after you watched the show because all of a sudden it will be a Nobel Prize winning masterpiece. But jokes aside, book three is my favorite and always was my favorite. I love Alina. Like, saying that after I watched the show is kind of funny to me. But I love Alina, and I love Mal, and I love the Darkling, and I love Genya, and I love all of them. <laughs> I love them so much. And this is like, I'm only like 50 pages in, and it's like, <laughs> Alina's snark is everything to me. Alina, do you know how I made that shot back in the kettle? If you say it's because you're just that good, I'm going to take off my boot and beat you with it. A queen. Literally a queen. I know I already said this in the video, but I'm just reiterating my thoughts like it was two years ago. The fact that... I will just comment ahead, this is a spoiler vlog anyway, but when the Darkling dies, like, again, he is absolutely my favorite or my second favorite character. Probably my favorite. And I absolutely think he had to die because there was nothing left for him. Like, he would just be filling his time with basically crimes to be able to do something or feel anything like he's too old he's lived enough he can't handle the fact that he's alone it's exactly like alina says it's like he was burdened with too much power and he was fed ego by his mother like there was no way he could function as like a normal person especially given that he's a thousand years old but the fact that alina needs three amplifiers to even put up a fight against him and then she doesn't even kill him with her magic she kills him because he lets her kill him actually goes to show how powerful he is and how big of a deal it is to him that no one's on his level plus he's an amplifier like he would never ever ever have a normal relationship with anyone after he realizes that Lelina isn't his equal and never will be and that Bagra is dead. Like, he would never, never, never be able to have a relationship without them wanting to use him or at least him thinking that they would want to use him. Which is why I think that him dying was the best possible thing that could have happened for everyone involved. Is it sad? Yes. But it absolutely had to happen. Like, it had to happen. Because if she with three amplifiers, <laughs> like, destroys the fold and then kills him just because he let her, that should actually kind of tell you everything. But I just forgot how much I love Delina. Mal is my favorite in book three. Like, this is absolutely his book. Like, in the last two books, he was kind of a sidekick. He had his, like, teenager annoying phase, which you kind of all forget that they're 16 here. <laughs> Darkling aside, they're literally, like, 16-year-olds. I think at least. Maybe 17 at this point teenagers <laughs> so him being like a little jealous is pretty generic actually and kind of expected but i love him in book three i love him in book three ben barnes bless his soul i love him i've loved him since i was a kid and he's a nerd he tried to even in that shit show he tried to shove every quote he could in there but he still can't affect the entire writing of the show can he book darkling book darkling <laughs> i don't even need to say anything but <sighs> i love what she did with alina in book three because it's a slight corruption arc because the fact that like as soon as she admits that she might not be that different from him and might not make different choices that's when the tether between them like is struck and the link is made I love it so much. I love it so much. I mean, this like Raylo bond thing, you know what I mean if you've seen Star Wars, but like this bond thing is like impeccable. <laughs> I love it so much. Every time that there was a scene like that, I was so happy. There is a very hilarious lack 
of the Darkling actually past book one. I mean, in book one, too. Because he's kind of an antagonist and then kind of a love interest. Not really, though, but kind of present here and there. Like, he's a very, very odd character. I said that in the first video. I think he's severely underdeveloped, but that's okay because that was Lee's first book. But in book three, every time he showed up, I remember, what, when did I read this? Like, in high school anyway, I just remember the joy that I felt <laughs> any time that they linked through the bond. The thing that I really love about this scene where they have the bond is arguably the fact that he's finally behaving the way he should have been behaving from book one. And that is as someone who's old and experienced because when she tells him like you're not angry at me I left you buried beneath a pile of rubble and if I told you I respect your ruthlessness and then he literally tells her why waste my anger when the fault is mine like he's acknowledging the fact that he's way more experienced and he should have known better but also obviously but I seem to be a victim of my own wishes when you are concerned And then when she tells him that she wanted to see him and he's like surprised and stuff. <laughs> this, and I will say it because I said it when I first read it. This was right after Red Queen. Like Red Queen was the only thing I'd read like in my second era of reading after that break. And then immediately after it was Shadow and Bone because I think under the Maven tag there was like a similar on Tumblr. <laughs> This was like the era of Tumblr. There was like a someone who was my main Grisha blog, my main Maven blog, was reading the Grisha trilogy. And there was all this stuff about the Darkling. And I was like, oh, <laughs> another Maven. Let's go read it. And then I was like, this is better written, more nuanced. <laughs> and my Maven equivalent actually has good writing and a good arc. And I was like... This is excellent. And I say that as the number one Maven stab. So anytime I read The Darkling, I get the same, like, <sighs> how do you even say that? Like the same neurological response, we will call it, as when I was reading Maven. But it just feels more nuanced and more thought out. Apparently all I will rant about is The Darkling in this in this book three but did you expect anything else did you expect anything else two years later i still have to rant about him like this is the one outlet where i get to actually rant about him because like spoiler vlogs but when he tells her i sought the amplifiers for you so that we might rule as equals you tried to take my power for your own after you ran for me after you chose we would have ruled as equals in time i love the duality of what he tells her here because both of them are correct and that's why i love alina <laughs> like i love the darkling but i love alina too and they're both correct because he genuinely wants an equal he's wanted an equal all his life considering the fact that the grisha are also to him equal to otkazatsia because they want him for his bones like they're treating him the way that humans treat grisha so it's true he's always wanted an equal, but she's also correct because he's so far gone and so used to control and power that there's no way he would let her be his equal at the same time. Like he wants something that she and he both know he would never actually be able to keep because he wants an equal, but as he is, he would never be able to keep an equal because he's way too used to being the wisest the most powerful always right always in control so like it's just a very sad duality that he wants a thing that he realistically really cannot have anymore i'm sorry <laughs> i'm sorry for the wonky camera i just cannot stop discussing every line in this scene because the duality of both of them is like showing so much because in that dialogue where he's like do you think it would be any different with your tracker or with that Lance of pup? Yes, because you would be the strong one. 
because you're better men than you. You might make me a better man. You might make me a monster. Like, again, both of them are correct. Both of them are correct because both of those things are possibilities. Like, she might be a good influence on him. He might be a bad influence on her. It's Technically, it's both. And he is very correct that she would enjoy being the strong one in the relationships with both men. The same way that he wants to be the strong one in a relationship with her, even though he kind of wants equals. I love this. This is exactly my point. Like, 60 pages into book three, and I'm already like, there is so much nuance to this power dynamic because I don't want to use Yin and Yang because this is like a little bit more extreme than that. He will slaughter an orphanage later. But he's like just bad enough where he could be good and she's very good to the point where she could be bad and that's the best dynamic to read about especially in a young adult novel like i will say this <laughs> this is a hill i will die on six of crows was better written this was better plotted this was just a better story and way more nuanced in order to make a case for mal you were meant for more than me, and I'll die fighting to give it to you. But please don't ask me to pretend it's easy. Like, he's finally accepted his, accepted it. He's moved past it. He's like, you're probably going to be a queen. You're going to be powerful all your life. You're meant for more than me, and I want you to have it. Just don't force me to pretend that it's easy. I love them. Like, it's such a... I am, again... Not a fan of romance in books in general, because it's very rarely done well. But here, it's just so clear from the beginning that they're already going to be together, that it's just all, like, aspects of the same thing, but in a good way. Like, they were in love all of their lives, like, childhood best friends to lovers. And it's just... A little bit of angst, even though you know they're going to end up together. Which is why I was never... Like, <laughs> her dynamic with the Darkling is unmatched. But that's because of who they are as people. Like, snarky little bitches who are very powerful. But it was always very clear she was going to be with Mal. And anyone who's trying to argue differently is wrong and delusional. I noticed in the show, I didn't watch it, but I saw, like, a scene that they make, made her bro break up with Mal and she, like, marries Nikolai. <laughs> the entire show just feels like very, very bad fanfic. Very bad fanfic. I would be so embarrassed to have my name attached to it, but we're not going to be talking about the show. We're talking about the books and how good they actually are. I didn't know Alina could also summon Starlight, because, like, I, yes, it's all light, but she's the sun summoner. The same way that the Darkling is a shadow summoner. So why Starlight? Like when they go out, she can also apparently summon Starlight. That feels like such a random thing. Shouldn't she be weaker at night because there's no sun to draw from? I have questions. <laughs> I don't think we, she ever uses like the Starlight thing again. Maybe it's just like the source of all light. So she's kind of like able to do it all but didn't know she could do starlight my queen is an icon because when he reveals the i am become a blade tattoo she's like could be worse i mean if it said let's cuddle or i am become ginger pudding that would be embarrassing book alina is like one of my favorite female main characters of all time alongside basia and like Kiyori. There's a couple others, but I'm forgetting right now. I love her. I remember reading I'm sorry. I remember reading it both of those times and now again when I'm much older than the first time. She's just such a well written main character because there are main female characters who are like hilariously irritating and quippy and annoying and arrogant. She's just very real about all of it like she's sarcastic when she's arrogant she usually comments on it when she's greedy she acknowledges it like alina is just a phenomenal main character i will be taking note 
criticisms of her. <laughs> like, the Darkling and Mal, there's points to be made about both of them. But Alina is my precious child, and I will not be hearing anything about her. Like, after the show, my brain was like, you like Alina. <laughs> you love Alina, so just get this atrocity out of your head. And now that I properly and thoroughly have, I was correct. I love Alina, and I will always love Alina. I remember this from the second video that I made. I was bitching about Nikolai because that was his book, but how much Mal hates him and how irritated Elena is by him is honestly iconic. People who keep arguing that Nikolai was ever an option clearly have no critical thinking left because she, he was never an option. Elena is so irritated by him. Like, romantically, he was never an option. They are, I guess allies or friends in the end although i wouldn't really call them friends either but <laughs> i love how the guy just says doesn't matter if it's a darkling on the throne or some useless lonsoff and then later when she's like impossible mal is just like don't say it <sighs> of course it's nikki of course it's nikki because i can never be rid of him <laughs> here's the thing I despise Nicola. <laughs> like, none of that is news to you. None of that is news to anyone who knows me and how I feel about these books. But the thing that I hate in most young adult books is that somehow, at the end of the story, it's a great idea to have the teenager be king. Like, I think Nikolai is a little bit older than them, so he could be, like, anywhere from 18 to, like, 22. <laughs> I think that's the range. I don't think he's that much older than them. But it just, it being the correct choice that the reckless prince who really doesn't care about being a king is the best choice to be a king is exhausting to me in fiction. I think I have to not fairly compare it to Lord of the Rings because Aragorn is someone who's very old and experienced and when he's king you're kind of like, yes finally like he's come into who he was supposed to be but with all these like teenager rebel like pirate in this case princes who are practically like good with their crew but they would never be good at running a nation like just because someone's a good person although I I hate using that for Nikolai because I cannot stand him but just because someone's an okay person doesn't mean that they should, like, be ruler of everything. <laughs> like, in these stories, I always expect them to, like, move past the bloodline thing. Like, he doesn't have to be a king just because he's the only option left. <laughs> like, there has to be a better choice than having an arrogant teenager be the ruler of your healing country after a very long war and taking control of all the Grisha and protecting them and striving for peace and fending off the other borders. Like, just because he's a good captain to 30 people doesn't mean he would be a good ruler. And I hate that about young adult books because I'm all for unrealistic plots with teenagers because it's fantasy. But any time that, like, a young adult trilogy or series ends with all the important positions of state, religion, whatever, are all taken up by teenagers just because they're main characters. I'm like, this this country would not work longer than for like, longer than like two weeks. <laughs> but the fact that it's Nikola here is even more agitating to me because I hate him. Anytime he shows up on page, like my brain just refuses to cooperate and wants to do anything else. <laughs> First of all, I miss Bagra so much. This, like, talk that she has with Alina in the mountains is one of the better ones because they actually finally discuss the Darkling and, like, the fact that she fueled everything that he became. <laughs> but what I found more relatable <laughs> was come in and shut the door girl you're you're letting the heat out she keeps saying that every time someone walks into her room and that's me that's literally me because i heat up my room very rarely because i rely on like jackets and blankets and sweaters 
but when I do heat up my room, someone can open my door for like a quarter of a second to get in and I will be like, you're letting the heat out. Stop it. I felt this in my soul. <laughs> Let's talk about the fact that the Darkwing and Mal are related. I think there's like a scene where the Darkling realizes it or something like that. Or maybe he doesn't, but in my mind, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious because of how much they hate each other <laughs> and they're related. Like, what are the odds? Like, obviously very distantly related. Like, Mal is the descendant of the Darkling's, like, aunt, I think it was. So, like, a very distant relative <sighs> but it feels like such a punch in the face for both of them and it's so funny it's so so funny so like to reiterate because i feel like my position is kind of unique within this fandom i hate nikolai the darkling is my favorite character but i do not ship him with alina and i don't think it was ever romantic i love her with mal <laughs> I feel like all three of those things are unpopular opinions. <laughs> like, I'm not a Dark Lena stan. I cannot stand the prince. And I love her with Mal. And I think Mal is a great character. So I feel like I gave my, like, slogan <laughs> about unpopular opinions to my YouTube channel solely because of this trilogy. Here is exactly what I wanted to talk about. Now, Genya is also definitely one of my favorite characters. When she, like, stands up to the king, it's the best moment ever. I am not ruined, I am ruination. But there is one thing we have to talk about, and one of the main reasons why I hate Nikolai and royal characters in general. After this discussion, where it's <laughs> established that she poisoned her skin to the point that he is, like, dying from how much he was abusing her, raping her, whatever else he was doing to her. And Nikolai is like sending her to trial for high treason and he's retiring his dad. Retiring his dad. That's it. No consequences ever. I don't think Ganya herself should have killed him. I think what she did to him was much worse. How he had to die slowly from, like, organ failure. Honestly, an icon. A queen. But it's Nikolai's reaction that I have a problem with. Because he was practically like, Dad, you have to abdicate. Ganya, you will be taken to high, high treason court. For colluding with the Darkling against the crown. But then he retires his dad, so it's kind of like, <laughs> Darkling aside, all of the Grisha that are here, that have nothing to do with him, they all colluded against the king. The king is insane. Your brother was insane and an abuser. I don't think there's such a thing as treason against him, considering that you just accepted that he sucks too, because you forced him to retire. Like, <sighs> You could make an argument of it being like, formality he'd never actually do it he has to say that but fuck formality is this a fantasy world or isn't it like <sighs> Nikolai should be pissed if Nikolai were the golden boy everyone wants him to be he would be pissed he would send his father to like die in a dungeon <laughs> and never speak to him again not silently force him to abdicate and still live in luxury in a in a place that looks like a palace alina herself says with a lot of money and all of the luxury as he's slowly dying like he not only does he not deserve it he deserves the opposite and the fact that he intends to take genya to trial and just leave his father to chill in luxury not only does it not sit sit right with me it makes me hate him so much more makes me hate him so much more now there might be like something else to add about this scene because i haven't completed it yet you can have like arguments that are like but he doesn't do it he doesn't mean it i'm just talking about this scene and the fact that this could be the scene that i point to when i explain about why i hate nikolai it's one of those <laughs> it's one of those tropes that's like sort of like merlin 
which one of my favorite shows of all time. Once a royal, always a royal. Like once, once a rich kid, always a rich kid in your mentality. Like you're never going to actually be able to understand the other side of the coin. And I love that, but here it's almost making it look like he's right. I will be fair. I will amend my statement because like he banished them and stuff. I will amend my statement. However, however, he deserved to die. <laughs> like he had to be locked up somewhere to suffer until he died. Like it was years of getting his life, years treated as their plaything. And they get to leave in luxury, live somewhere warm. Like Nikolai literally tells him, go somewhere warm. Your health is failing. You will live in luxury. Why? All across the country, your people are dying and starving, being drafted, but your, your dad will live in luxury somewhere warm. Like, yes, he threatened to have him killed if he didn't abdicate, but he knew he would. Essentially, he was like, Dad, if you step aside, you can continue your life as casually as you have so far. Maybe you'll find some servant girls for yourself over there where you leave, but... You won't be king anymore because that makes it better. And the fact that he's like, if you don't leave, I'll have you tried for rape. Delightful. <laughs> so you're not going to do it anyway. I just have a very, very tough time with this kind of stuff because it's always like you're creating a fictional world. with Fictional rules and magic and fictional settings and laws. But the one thing that you decide to keep always is just the absolute horror of royalty. And it's just fascinating to me that that's the one thing that every fantasy writer sticks with. It's like everything can be fictional, but I draw the line at having royalty face their crimes. <laughs> you know when you just hate a character no matter what they say? We all have someone like this. It's it's just Nikolai for me. I feel like when he's saying something that's halfway decent, I'm like, I hate you. <laughs> I hate him so much. Characters like that, in general, I despise to read about. But, like, princes get used to the word yes. I know he uses it all as jokes. But the whole thing that's like, I'm actually stunning. Hilarious. <laughs> I might have to exert myself. Very funny. It's like just the whole thing about being openly arrogant and hoping that it's going to be funny is is exhausting to me. <laughs> Literally exhausting. It's like I have a I have a lot of money. A lot of it. Groundbreaking, Nikolai. I've never heard anyone tell jokes the way you do. If Alina wasn't annoyed by him, I would like her a lot less. Like, a lot less. And if anyone's ever wondering why I never read his duology, this is why. As soon as I was like, there's a book about Nikolai, I am steering clear of that. And considering that I heard that they bring back the Darkling and they give him an even worse ending where he turns into a tree, I think I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Like we don't need to we don't need to dive into that, but I just wanted to say like like this is chapter nine, I wanna say. It's been a hundred pages since the Darkling made any kind of cameo at this point. Like he's a cameo in this book. Now they're gonna have another bond. I think that's the one where where he tells her his name, which that scene made me cry when they didn't do it in the show because the fact that his name is such a closely guarded secret because Bagra taught him to like keep it to himself and to never tell it to anyone is so significant to his character that I hated how they just threw out his name in the show and they started calling him by it. I hated it. I absolutely hated it. But it's been a hundred pages since we last saw him so I think I'm gonna read to page like 200 which is about halfway through the book and then I'm gonna stop for the day. We're making very good progress considering it took me two years to pick this back up. We're making very, very good progress. I hope you're having fun. I think this one will be the most ranty out of the three because again, as I said, said, this is my favorite book of the three by like by far. <laughs> if I had to rank them, it would be like 
book three, book one, book two. <laughs> so this should probably be the most ranty one. I love when she needs an intellectual conversation. She just lets the bond with the darkling like harden. I, I love it so much. I'm sorry for the use of that word in this instance, but Titan. No, that's not better. <laughs> Whichever word you like, but I love how he just doesn't care anymore. He's like being healed. He knows she's there, but he couldn't care less. He just starts talking. He's like, there's something I've been wondering. I love them so much. I love them so much. <sighs> I love him so much. It felt so easy to be with him. And the fact that Lee finally confirms this, that I've been, like, arguing about since book one. The fact that he's like, you drew me in. I needed your loyalty, Alina. I needed you to be bound to me by more than duty or fear. Exactly what I've been saying. He wasn't in love and he wasn't being a prat. <laughs> Although he does turn into one later again there's a fine line when you're a fan of his character between he can do no wrong and actually establishing that he's not all bad but he definitely wanted her to be loyal to him by wanting to be loyal to him he just didn't do it in the best way <laughs> there's something that i've been wondering about for years for as long as i've been reading young adult why is the banter always the best with the villain? Why? No one's forcing you to write it that way. Like every single author, whether they like the villain or not, whether they want the villain to be like the love interest or not, like Red Queen to so many other young adults. Why is the main character's banter always the best with the villain? Like when you compare one conversation she has with the Darkling to anything she talks about with Mal or with... Nikolai like with Nikolai it's very dry and just like weird quips at each other with Mal it's obviously longing pining and that kind of stuff but with the Darkling it's an actual conversation about like feelings thoughts events people good and evil like <laughs> why do they always make it that the most interesting interactions are between the main character and the villain Yes, I know the villain is who they have to take down. So the villain has to be an equal in every right to make you actually care about the hero taking the villain down. I'm sorry, I'm trying to turn on another ambient video. But it's just so hilarious that one single conversation with this man is so much more interesting than the last hundred pages that I read with all the other characters. I am a little biased because he is my favorite character, but objectively, and you have to, have to admit this for every young adult book, a bit less for adult books because there's a lot more characters, like him or hate him, the villains are the best conversationalists for some reason every single time. And they are the only characters who actually like get to the core of the main characters and make them question things. They are supposed to. But it's still hilarious how they are the best people to do it, considering they're supposed to be someone who the main character despises. Back then, when I was like, what, 15? Maybe 16, I think 15. This scene owned me. Like, the scene in his study owned me. <laughs> You're meant to be my balance, Selena. You're the only person in the world who might rule with me, who might keep my power in check. And who will balance me? What if I'm no better than you? What if instead of stopping you, I'm just another avalanche? I remember rereading that scene so many times. Like, just this scene alone. Because, excuse me, what is that? What is that? Like, I still don't ship them, but why? You couldn't have given that to her and Mal. Like, why? Oh, here it is. I want you to know my name, he said. The name I was given, not the title I took for myself. Will you have it, Alina? The way he words it is like a heavy burden. Like, do you want to know? 
the one true part of myself that I never gave to anyone else. And the fact that that little broken boy part of himself is like, you were the only one who came close to being my equal. I want you to know me in this way. And when he's dying and when he's dead, she's the only one who knows his name and she respects it and mourns for it, even though she was the one that killed him. I loved that detail always. How she's actually sad that he's dead, despite knowing it had to be done. And how she just like says his name as a silent prayer and is like, I hope you'll be better now and stuff. But <sighs> just I didn't have to stand here in the darkling's arms, but I didn't want to go. Despite everything, I wanted this whispered confidence. Yes, I breathed. After a long moment, he said, Alexander. A little laugh escaped me. He arched a brow, a smile tugging at his lips. What? It's just so common. I, I can't. See, I thought it wouldn't be as emotional this time around because like, it's been so many years. But this series and these characters just mean so much to me that I'm kind of... It is a nostalgia in a way, even though I didn't read it as it was coming out. But it's nostalgia in a way. Like, this was the second series, again, after my, like, reading break that I ever, like, <laughs> poured all of myself into. I lived for this, like, for this book at the time. <laughs> but how he's realistically smiling and laughing and you can see the real person underneath that hurts me every time and it hurts me every time it adds the nuance but it hurts <laughs> his smile deepened and he's cocked his and he cocked his head to the side it almost hurt to see him see him this way you and me both alina this is exactly my point she's so relatable she always thinks exactly what i think will you say it he asked I hesitated, feeling danger crowned in on me. Alexander, I, whis I whispered. I I'm saying it like the Slavic way, by the way. I know in the show they say Alexander. <laughs> he leaned in. I felt his breath against my neck, then the press of his mouth against my skin just above the collar. And then like how she draws back and he's like, let me. <sighs> let me. He's practically like begging both himself and her to let go because he's like, always in this dual state of let me but also don't let me here's the thing here is where the thing is I, I feel like I memorized this entire scene by the way but when he tells her like let me it isn't real he said let me that specific bit hurts me a little bit for both of them because he's like let me do it Neither of us will be affected by this because it isn't real. Like, this isn't reality. We can't become monsters. We can't become better people. This isn't real. <laughs> so let you, let yourself have someone who understands what it is to be what you are. And let me have someone who can be an equal in my power. Who can be a companion I can have intellectual conversations with. It's essentially like, this isn't real. Let both of us pretend we can have exactly what we want to have. And it's upsetting. It's so upsetting. Because he is definitely not what she wants and needs. And he's slowly starting to realize that she could never be what he needs. And it's so, it's so upsetting. I never, ever, ever, ever thought that what was, what was between them was love. It was just a very desperate need for someone who understood. <laughs> I probably didn't even read the next paragraph before talking because that's exactly what she says. Exactly what she says. <laughs> I felt that rush of hunger, the steady longing beat of desire that neither of us wanted but that gripped us anyway. We were alone in the world, unique. We were bound together and always would be. And it didn't matter. That entire paragraph is exactly what I just said. It's going to be a while before I get another Dark Hole scene, and the next one will probably be the one where he slaughters the orphanage and tells her that he will strip away anything she knows until all she has left is him. So, see, I have it all memorized, just like nerd boy Ben Barnes, who shoved all of these quotes into the show, by the way. He must have petitioned so hard 
like considering he was killed off in the most hilarious way possible to just be able to say all of the quotes for the fans and i love him for it <laughs> but like this is my darkles this is my alina and i love them so much <laughs> I love them so much. And as much as I hate to say it, but sort of like Nikolai, the people who thought that Dark Alina, Dark Alina ever stood a chance and was ever an actual couple, an actual love interest relationship, are so delusional. <laughs> and I say that as someone who's the biggest fan of them. Who's the biggest fan of them. The Dark Alina is my favorite character. Alina is like very close behind him. But you're delusional if you think they ever stood a chance as an actual couple. Like he's a thousand years old. He wants something she will never be, and he will never be what she needs, so. I have another question. Who wounded him so badly that he needed such long healing? Who wounded him, and how? Like, I have questions that I need answered. Also, I blame Adebe for this. But <laughs> the thought of him, like, putting a bloodied shirt back on is a little bit embarrassingly attractive. But if you watch anime, I think you're going to know what I mean. Every character becomes infinitely more attractive when they're covered in blood. It's just science at this point. But <sighs> who wounded him? I need to know this. I need to know these things. <laughs> also, I feel like I can make a meme with, like, everyone. The Darkling. An apt pupil. Like, he just keeps saying an apt pupil. I love him so much. This might be the wrong time to rant about this, but I feel like it's kind of apt. But do you have like specific images of characters in your head without seeing their faces? <laughs> like I know his hair is black and he has gray eyes. I know she has white hair and brown eyes here, but I never really see their faces. I never see any character's faces. It's more like a blurry outline. Like I never actually see see their expressions like your brain struggles to perfectly visualize something that isn't there so like i kind of base some scenes off fan art that i've seen but then anytime they're moving or doing something with their face i can't clearly see it it's like just a blurry outline with the colors of their hair and eyes if that makes any sense and skin in some instances but I also love the shift because as soon as she rejects basically like <laughs> getting into the delusions pretending that they're anything other than what they are he's like I will hunt you like an animal you will find no sanctuary you will have no peace <laughs> this is exactly what I mean he is unhinged at this point like <laughs> he's realizing that he's not gonna get what he wants in her and his mother left him, he's like just snapping like like this. 1,000 years of self-control are toppling. He's like, I will hunt you like an animal. <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing at this, but, but I am. This is fiction. 